Hello, um, good afternoon, everyone in India. And um, uh, good morning, maybe good evening, maybe good night in some places. This is an international um, conference. It's the Global Law School Summit 2021 of the OP Jindal Global University. And we are in full swing with this conference with one exciting discussion after another. Um, I'm very happy to invite all of you to listen into uh, a thematic session that's been titled Addressing Global Anxieties, Research in Global Law. Um, my colleague Srijit said that um, um, the reason I'm here is because he also meant global policies um, and not just global law. It's, I'm the only odd person out. We have a fantastic panel of distinguished lawyers and law teachers, um, but I'm the Dean of the School of Government and Public Policy, and um, I'm uh, generally referred to as a professor of practice. That means I'm not quite an academic, um, um, but it's okay, um, because I've got some work experience <laughs> over 30 odd years in the Ford Foundation and the United Nations Development Program, um, and some education in uh, as it happens in five universities, um, beginning with Mysore, then Bangalore, then Delhi, Oxford, and Cambridge. So uh, thanks to the wonderful scholarship system and much less competition in my years than there is now for my students. So I'm delighted to have a wonderful panel to discuss um, this theme. And I'll say a few words about the theme um, before, uh, uh, after I introduce the panel, um, we have on the panel, uh, Professor Arad Reisberg. He's an, uh, the head of the Brunel Law School and the professor of corporate law and finance over there. Um, he's um, uh, been a member of the F Financial Law Committee. He's on the advisory group of uh, the Bank of England on Brexit. He's the author of um, several books, including one called Derivative Actions on Corporate Governance. Um, he's the editor of, of uh, uh, journals related to this field. Um, so welcome to you, uh, Professor Reisberg. Um, then we have uh, Susan Karamanian, who is uh, an old friend of India. We've just been um, talking a little bit about her first visit to Kolkata in this country. She's the Dean of the College of Law at the Hamad bin Khalifa University. Um, and before that, she was Provost and Chief Academic Officer of the American University at Sharjah. Um, you know, she's um, been in many, many places. Uh, she's taught at the faculties in, um, in um, the Hague Academy of International Law. She's a member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law. Um, long list of um, accomplishments, and um, and and, and she's, um, I should say, uh, also um, a, a Rhodes Scholar uh, at Somerville College in Oxford in her youth. Um, so welcome to you, um, Susan. Um, we have uh, Professor Sahari. Uh, from the Ahmed Ibrahim Kulia of uh, Laws International Islamic University, Malaysia. And, um, uh, and he's um, uh, again, uh, a specialist in, uh, in, um, the, in uh, uh, oil field service contracts, which I believe was your, was your dissertation. Um, he's uh, got several papers published. He's, um, um, He's a member of the advisory board of the International Energy Law Advisory Group um, and an advocate and solicitor in the High Court in Malaysia. Then we have um, uh, our um, uh, good colleague, um, uh, Dr. Shashikala Gurupur. Um, she's, uh, um, uh, she's you know, from my state, Karnataka. So uh, I. Um, I had to mention that, and uh, um, she's um, again a specialist in international law, um, and has been uh, taught in uh, many universities. And she's been continuing with the Symbiosis Law School, 
um, for some time um, since 2007, and um, she's um, you know in in um, a number of fields: um, jurisprudence, media law, uh, feminist legal studies, biotechnology, law and social transformation, um, and so on. So polymath. Um, then, um, um, then we have um, um, Professor B. S. Chimney, who's well known to uh, you know scholars both in um, international law and outside of international law. People like me um, read Professor Chimney um, to educate ourselves, um, and he's um, um, he's also a, 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 a professor uh, in the general global. Um, law school um, I've had the privilege of meeting him on campus and he's very well known um, to all of us so I will not um, take time uh, narrating a, a long list of achievements and uh, the various places where he's, um, he's taught um, and, um, and so this is a that's great panel and but I was trying to make some sense of um, the theme global anxieties and um, um, and to and to figure out by listening to um, all of you panel members uh, what we might do about uh, about the global anxieties. Is there a role for law? What's the role for policy? And um, this is um, this is because um, you know we firstly there's the anxiety that's been caused by the pandemic. <laughs> Which is still not over. It's had very far-reaching implications around the world um, for public health in several countries, uh, for uh, multilateralism. Um, we've seen that the uh, pandemic has um, affected uh, a spirit of um, global sharing uh, that uh, is very much needed, but there's been a tendency for countries to, um, to if you like, uh, uh, take the greater part of the vaccines that are available and leaving several other countries with much less. So that's one pointer to a problem that's uh, been in the making, not just um, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, um, the whole question of uh, multilateralism. Um, so we found that um, some hard-won uh, multilateral agreements and institutions are uh, under stress. So, you know, we had uh, uh, the the, the uh, COP uh, uh, at uh, Glasgow following the the Paris Agreement, but that's under stress. We we are not sure what. Um, the outcomes would be what each country would deliver. Um, so um, that wasn't um, um, a ringing success in terms of multilateral cooperation. Um, we've got um, problems with the, the WTO and its uh, dispute resolution body. Um, and we are seeing long established international laws and mul multilateral practices that have been devalued by geopolitical tensions a kind of unilateralism and ad hocery. There's a growing disconnect between people, government and institutions. Uh, trust in government is very low in uh, many countries. Um, and um, and we, 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 we place a lot of hope on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, but um, uh, it would be fair to say that uh, many people are losing faith in the capacity of uh, their governments to deliver on those goals. And so we need to reverse these trends that have been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic, uh, because otherwise we risk uh, damaging the values, principles, laws, and systems that have been the med bedrock of the international community um, for a very long time. Um, and, and it's we, we need these um, uh, a revival of uh, these values and principles much more now than ever before. Um, so uh, the, there is we've, we've had the charter 
uh, we had the International Court of Justice, uh, both signed at the same time, um, you know, providing a political and a legal form um, to the core of the international system. Um, there are some, some uh, successes. Um, uh, for instance, the Montreal Protocol is regarded as a success. Um, you know, most um, uh, air conditioners and refrigerators now um, don't um, put out the, the gas that they used to. Um, the ozone layer is in a little better shape. Um, so that's something to be uh, noteworthy, but you might also say that the, uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty has held out. In other words, there hasn't been a rampant expansion of uh, countries wanting to go nuclear. Uh, some countries did, uh, but um, uh, it still held out. Um, so that's kind of, uh, in some sense, uh, the, it's worked. Um, and then we have the Sustainable Development Goals, which are currently um, what we are concerned about. But um, there is, um, um, uh, so these are the challenges, I think, um, that we face. Um, they, you know, if you like, uh, they have to do with the future of uh, multilateral cooperation. It has to do with the uh, post-pandemic recovery of the economies uh, that have been badly hit. It's got to do with migration, um, the crisis of migration, uh, not just uh, uh, economic migrants, but also uh, climate uh, affected uh, refugees who uh, uh, can no longer eke a livelihood in the places they lived in because of drastic changes in climatic conditions um, that have already uh, occurred. Um, so we've got um, a severe crisis in inequality um, in the world, inequality um, within countries, um, uh, which has increased um, um, inequality in India has been steadily increasing. Um, and um, in inequality in China has been increasing. So uh, with countries like India and China that began with very low inequality uh, amongst its population groups um, in recent times, uh, that inequality has, uh, drastically increased. We used to think it was a problem with developing countries in Latin America, Brazil in particular. It's no longer the case. Uh, India and China are in serious trouble with inequalities and there's worries about uh, unemployment. So I, I'm, I'm not sure um, how we are going to tackle it, but there's also, because many of you are experts in, um, in, in finance, um, in international finance, um, you know, one of the concerns uh, that came up after uh, Glasgow is um, how are we to get some, you know, what you might call just transitions, right? I mean, um, to support um, a, a low carbon or um, net zero um, world, uh, which will uh, stop putting the enormous and accelerating pressures on the planet. Um, and so that require, calls for a vision of a reformed global economy, it calls for a transformation in capitalism, um, you know, that has to have, um, that has to happen. Um, it also calls for legal frameworks for impact, uh, you know, concepts of fiduciary duty and related duties at the core of financial regulation, you know, they must be updated uh, to uh, take care of, uh, you know, our ESG uh, impacts uh, as they are called not just on financial reforms, but also um, the impacts of investments. Um, so there's um, you know, no end really to uh, anxieties and uh, issues. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to you know, go specifically and direct any specific uh, set of concerns to any of my panel members, uh, but I'll just ask them to lead off with some thoughts on what's uppermost in terms of uh, the, the catalog, um, uh, admittedly incomplete, uh, that I just set out. So I'd like to begin with Professor um, Riesberg. Um, I was thinking of him when I made the last uh, last point about um, uh, transition um, costs and uh, financing some of these um, um, agenda. I mean, you know, development uh, SDGs as well as uh, climate finance, all of these um, issues. Um, so over to you, uh, Professor Riesberg, 
um, for about you know five six minutes I think, and then we'll um, go through the panel and then uh, come back uh, on some specific issues if others pick it up uh, amongst you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this introduction, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be joining you this afternoon or this morning from London. Um, wow, where does one start with all these anxieties? I think a very good uh, point to begin our journey, our quest, is to talk about trust. I think we are now at, um, at a stage where in the development and the global anxieties that we face um, these days, um, it's a foundation of everything that we do. So um, when, you, when we say that there is now a global uh, uh, crisis in all those areas, starting from the pandemic, financial institutions, politicians, government, there is a global trust crisis. And I think one of this interesting thing is um, we, we come to a stage, I think, in evolution in societies in global law, where we say on the one hand that we do not trust politicians, bankers, institutions, <clears throat> but at the same time, we can trust strangers to, you know, we share a ride with them in Uber or we view our Facebook friends and <clears throat> we look at them as um, even more trustworthy then um, I would say then uh, those that we put on institutions to govern us. Um, so there is a question that I think we are in um, what some people call a distributed trust crisis. Um, and it's the beginning of, we're in a, a position I think in the world right now where there is magnitude manifest of a number of issues that we need to come together that we want that are those who we put in a position of power to solve. But at the same time, we do not really trust them to resolve it, whether it's the, the banks, whether it's governments and so on. Um, and I think there is um, something to be said about um, what I call the, the genuine voice and the influence of the people on the ground uh, on institutions. Um, so there is, um, I think, a lot of I would say uh, voices on the ground, uneasiness. Uh, we see that a lot, actually. We saw that you mentioned Glasgow, in the streets of Glasgow uh, and otherwise. Um, and I think those sort of voices are sort of airing the concern. They're very genuine concerns. They're very real concerns. They are, um, I would say, existential concerns, whether it's to do with the environment, whether it's to do with the pandemic. So while there is more and more the need is to work together, there is more and more fragmented, I would say, um, um, causes, interests, and so on. Um, and I think, you know, for my area of expertise in corporate law, <clears throat> for many years I've been, uh, you know, teaching my students and writing about that. The frustration is that um, there is this competition between jurisdictions to attract business, to attract corporations, yet the multinationals corporations are the ones who are actually uh, dominating a lot of the conversations, but we do not hold them accountable. So, for example, on taxation, the, the recent treaty to try to, to, to hold account those big um, um, international corporations is one example of a way forward. It's not going to change the discourse. It's not going to change, but it's about symbolic gestures to bring back trust in those institutions. Um, and so I think there is also, you mentioned that, you know, you've been around for, for some time. I feel myself when I teach my students that I'm sort of in a, in a different generation to them, the generation of the students and, and people that we see in the classroom. Um, but they are really, really concerned. They really care about where we live and they're asking us why we're not taking any action. And so I think I have hope that by them pushing and putting it to the agenda, there will be some change. There will be, um, you know, um, a shift, um, almost by need, almost by uh, uh, to death. But I am not. I think we. I do not think that it's going to be um, the governments themselves that are going to make this. I would say this breakthrough um, um, in health. 
And I just want to, it's not my area of expertise, but of course, this is the biggest crisis that we, we are facing at the moment. And it's, it's an ongoing crisis. But unless you share knowledge, I mean, and the recent variant, for example, from South Africa, unless you actually act honestly, again, talking about trust, unless you're ready to come forward and say very quickly, we have identified something, we know we're going to suffer the consequences financially and business-wise in South Africa, but we were honest enough, you gain trust. You gain trust. If you gain trust, there may be cooperation. If there's cooperation, we may get some solutions. But um, I think that's the only way forward. Um, but there are, I would say, some contrasting sort of voices and streams at the moment. So I hope it's a good opener for the beginning of our conversation. Mute. Uh, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, i quickly move over to uh, Professor Susan Karamanian um, for her remarks um, on this uh, broad canvas. Well, it, it is a broad one indeed. And, and uh, clearly uh, the, I, the areas you identified, uh, Dean, are important. And then of course the concept is, is as uh, Dean Reisberg just uh, referenced, uh, a lack of trust. I think it goes a little deeper, deeper than that. And also let me just respond to uh, uh, the suggestion of, of, uh, of where, where governance can emerge and this notion of, of letting the people on the ground uh, sort of uh, take, take ownership uh, um, of this. Um, I think it's, uh, and, and this builds on the trust thing, but the, what I'm very concerned about is the, the uh, challenges to uh, democracy and uh, the uh, uh, questions about the value of law uh, and uh, unregulated space. Uh, we have uh, Bitcoin, uh, we have artificial in intelligence, uh, areas in which uh, there's substantial activity, um, we have no sense of, of uh, where it's taking us and the consequences associated uh, with this. And if we were to uh, let corporations, for example, start to help shape the, uh, the agenda more on this without, without governments, um, I'm concerned about where the ultimate, uh, where we will be with the ultimate result. You know, a perfect example, uh, Dean Reisberg, just when I was listening to you was, was like, if we think of, of we can't regulate uh, with regard to content clearly. And so we're gonna let Facebook uh, establish standards. We've seen the consequences of, of that and, 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 and the like. And I, and, I, and I was just thinking when you were, were, were speaking about that is to, uh, we clearly want engagement of the, uh, of, of individuals, we need engagement of the of the private private sector. Yet we need a structure for the uh, uh, resolution of these issues. And your example of the, the OEC G20 uh, agreement on taxation, I think, is is is, is one that that is a um, a model. It's not perfect, uh, but at least uh, they were able to accomplish something that the United Nations has been uh, struggling with in terms of dealing with. Uh, uh, the fact that multinational corporations have been able to shift uh, uh, assets and tax liabilities and the like in a, in a way to avoid to avoid taxation. And getting back to uh, what uh, uh, the, the the dean mentioned earlier in terms of of, of ways to address address. Uh, um, New, new areas and, and like the carbon emissions, there's been some conversation that the OECD model on taxation could be a way to have an approach to deal with, with uh, carbon tax and, and, and the like. In, if, if, if you want to be able to establish trust, however, in addition to the political concerns that, that we have um, identified, and, and, and I, I think we have to be looking at growing nationalism too, uh, as, 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 as a challenge. Uh, we need to focus on, um, and we always say this, focus on education. Uh, but uh, we have highly educated people who are studying, uh, presenting papers and the like, yet for, for uh, many individuals, that information is completely ignored. Sorry, I'm not going to, to respect this, this view. How did we get to the point that uh, uh, we have rejected, we have rejected uh, science? 
uh, for, for example. And we've had years of, 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 of individual freedom of expression, uh, uh, focus on the, on the individual. Um, you know, you can look at it in the context of, of, of human rights and the like, yet we, we also have this, this balance in terms of, of the community. And we're seeing it played out now with masks Okay, my individual right versus the value to 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 the community. So even at that that micro level, uh, we have an inability to to govern. We have an inability to govern within local communities. Um, so if we can't have standards for uh, how we're going to treat each other on a simple question of perhaps a, a life or death um, situation and a very minor. Uh, uh, check of putting on putting on 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 a mask. Uh, I can understand where we are in terms of the daunting, um, uh, pot, you know, difficult the difficulties and da daunting task of of uh, developing solutions. If I could just chime in one other thing, and you know, in in anticipation of this and the questions you submitted to us, I think we can gather evidence, we can assess evidence, we can have endless debates, but we need individuals with moral conviction and political skills to implement solutions. And that I think is where, where we are lacking. And if you look at what's getting rewarded today, it is the person with the loudest voice and the person able to get people behind them, not based on, on reason to a certain extent, but based on, on emotion. Thank you for those observations. Um, I now move on to uh, Professor Zahari um, for his perspective. Um, thank you to the Dean, Prof. Fidoshen. And first and foremost, <clears throat> I would like to thank to the Jeddah Global Law School for inviting me and giving me a pretty opportunity to speak alongside the, all the prominent professors from all the reputable universities. I'm humbled to speak here together with uh, Prof. Jimmy, Prof. Shashakila, Prof. Suzette Kermanyam, and also Prof. Arad Resberg. Thank you very much. Okay, um, the way I look at it, um, actually we have, um, as a push of law, and also the policy at present, where there is a need to look uh, what are the problems at present and how to solve it by having an ideal policy, as well as policy context. So, it will look into the present circumstances um, and also the policy that might be relevant for that particular context on D, which is now. But uh, as we go along, as you mentioned on the modernization and also even like IR 4.0 now, and those policy might not be uh, relevant anymore in the features. And I think to have a forward looking policy somehow is a better, a better solution. Uh, this policy, I think it will be much more sustainable somehow and also will take into consideration of the global development. So, um, uh, for example, you, you, you give an example on the United Nations uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, we have the 17 goals. And I think such initiatives somehow um, would help the policymaker a lot to solve the global society problem, but we need to have a um, commitment on that. For example, uh, on the SDG 13 on climate action, the initiative is important uh, not only to solve the problem at present, but most importantly to solve the problem for our future generation. So then we have the Paris Agreement, we have the Kyoto Protocol, where the International Treaty, which was extended in 1992, um, UN United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, which require all the state to state parties to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, yeah? the GHG, and also based on the scientific consensus. Uh, it, it happened uh, now, um, and even it will affect uh, the future generation based on the, due to the human uh, carbon emission. So this Paris Agreement um, aims to increase the ability of the parties to adapt the climate change effects. So under the um, Paris Agreement, so each of the countries must determine plan and also to regularly report on its contribution. So when it's the state adopted it, adopted the Paris Agreement, and the country would be responsible for their national, uh, nationally determined uh, contribution, the uh, NDC. And this 
initiative will actually relate to goal, other goal of SDG as well. For example, on SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, and also SDG 11, on sustainable cities and community and so on. So that is how uh, the policy, the future, future approach of futuristic approach of the policy uh, would come into picture you now, and it is relevant. However, it requires the I think it requires the commitment from um, the state. But well, thank you very much for those remarks. Um, I now request uh, Professor Shashikala Gurupur for her comments. Thank you, Chair, uh, Professor Sudarshan, and uh, fellow uh, panelists. Um, we have already heard about the financial dimension, the, uh, uh, the theoretical insights, and uh, particular dimension from the energy law perspective. Um, I would like to combine the questions which were asked in the context of chairperson's uh, important pointers. Uh, in the light of the pandemic, in the light of uh, a conference of parties of, uh, on climate change, and uh, the multilateralism is withering away to some extent. Um, I was thinking uh, about some recent developments of uh, formation between Japan, India, and the US in terms of looking at deliverables under the climate change commitment, especially decarbonization, uh, looking at uh, innovation and uh, looking at uh, 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 funding. So that's one aspect. Second aspect I wanted to look at is what uh, Susan mentioned in terms of uh, democracy. How the facet of democracy as digital public square was coming in with the online uh, communities and spaces and interaction in a predominant way, getting reinforced with the pandemic situation. Um, and the online hate speech resulting in uh, worst effects on minority and others in terms of uh, the pandemic uh, generated vulnerabilities, further vulnerabilities. Um, I was also going to uh, talk about this whole idea of triangulation which came in as an approach to policy making in this direction. And where is, our, where is our concern about large majority of uh, people as academics or as advocates or as a civil society activists in their visibility in this discourse, whether it is new law, whether it is policymaking, whether it is a global multilateral relationship and negotiations. So uh, for me, the backdrop of international health regulations and the way in which it was uh, uh, manipulated rather, and the accountability issue there was never taken up. Maybe there was no time because we were busy in the innovation related to vaccine, in vaccine multilateralism or in vaccine nationalism, um, and also vaccine diplomacy. Um, so where, where is the uh, law and policy scholarship uh, in terms of its response is the question that I uh, always kept asking throughout this period of the last uh, two years. So I felt that till then there was, an, there was a world order which was predominantly imposed by a country or a group of countries who were strong in business, who had the know-how, who had the technology. And suddenly we started seeing uh, some kind of uh, fissure in that kind of, or some kind of seismic changes in that kind of international uh, pol political landscape and legal landscape. There were new issues emerging in terms of accountability. Um, interestingly, I read artic uh, articles uh, written by the scholars coming from that part of the world who were justifying their approach as uh, in support of multilateralism, but whereas they were telling that certain nations were uh, unilaterally declaring uh, whether it is vaccination or uh, trade uh, policies or things like that in terms of uh, shipping of uh, masks or shipping of medicines. So there were multiple challenges coming in for uh, human rights, for the, particularly for the vulnerable people in terms of border crossing, in terms of challenges coming in uh, uh, sea trade, challenges coming in uh, um, uh, transport and uh, that issue has remained unaddressed as such. And we jumped into the next issue of addressing the side effects of pandemic and controlling the effects of pandemic. 
Now, I kept wondering, the large majority of the world, which is below poverty line, which uh, lives on uh, less than $2 a day, and uh, uh, not many treaties bringing in empirical realities of this, because as it was rightly pointed out, whether nations have failed us, whether the governments rather have failed us in bringing these anguishes or anxieties to the table. I will give you examples from the grassroots engagement that uh, I have had uh, with my students and different researchers. For example, we did a study on South Asian women and we found that on reproductive choices or menstruation health, there were common anxieties. And these anxieties never got reflected in the policies or in the healthcare regulations and the exclusions. Number of domestic violence cases went um, escalating during the COVID period, reflecting that COVID did not create these uh, pain areas for human rights, but COVID just exacerbated the existing vulnerabilities. I was looking at the plight of sex workers, um, um, in whose case we found that general international issues were there, but particular cultural issues, um, which were compounded with the, uh, with the uh, uh, lack of policy or policy blindness, where triangulation was called for. So in this reality, um, I would uh, uh, like to posit before the panel that uh, uh, we, need to, we need to look at our academic research, our policy advocacy, and um, our, uh, um, our uh, government's action not to be uh, in uh, uh, what we call a silos. They need to integrate. And that's exactly where a triangulation dimension comes in, which very, uh, which very wisely was mentioned here. Uh, in the postmodern conditions, it is going to be the genealogy. Um, I wouldn't uh, uh, deplore the fragmentation of approaches. I would say that it is by creating meaningfulness through this fragmented knowledge that we could search for the common denominator of global justice, reflecting the reality. Global justice not coming from one particular part of those who are articulate, who could speak English language and express and publish. It should come from the unpublished hidden voices from those who are in the center, who are the beneficiaries in my opinion. So policy making so far has been more of a, an armchair exercise uh, looking at beneficiaries as reported rather than going and penetrating into the reality of beneficiaries. So um, whether it is the case of online hate speech, where uh, uh, before policy or law could respond to it, the global uh, conglomeration initiative was the one which, which said that we will have our content code. Now, where is the democracy here? And where are the voices coming from? Who regulated them? And internet space is something which is cross-border. It is beyond the boundary. And uh, in the beyond the boundary kind of space, uh, we have this. And in the Google case, it was very clear in the EU that uh, Google could only uh, download, I mean, sorry, uh, offload the content which is going against privacy only in the European context. And it did not do it beyond Europe uh, under the right to forget or uh, under the data privacy because it said that it could be threatening to uh, right to information in terms of human rights. So this kind of contradictions and conflicting uh, dimensions of law at the global level and uh, predominantly lawmaking countries regime being imposed through the global platforms and as Chimmy, Sir, and other scholars have highlighted from the third world perspectives on international law, poverty being invisible in this discourse, inequality being invisible in this discourse, where should the policy making focus? I would say focus on and cut through these multiple issues beyond the traditional approaches to put that, as Gandhi always said, put that, put that Daidra um, Narayan in the center, put that, uh, put that. Uh, a stakeholder, uh, it could be a woman who is uh, burqa clad all the time and has no voice. It could be the people who became invisible. It could be the terrains which became uh, washed off due to climate change. Or it could be, as we saw, uh, the human trafficking during disasters because of the invisibility of human rights within the disaster management discourses, uh, for which COVID is no exception. Um, uh, so, how do we look at this? Who is the vigilante on policymaking research? 
we need to create that kind of, I think, voice of conscience, which cuts across boundaries, law and disciplinary boundaries, as well as territorial boundaries. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for also um, reminding us that um, um, the first thing that, uh, for which we have evidence that happens with any disaster and pandemic not excluded is the uh, steep increase in um, the trafficking of women. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so there, you know, these are all um, complex issues, um, tackling disasters um, in, in the policy making literature, we call them wicked problems uh, because, uh, you know, there is no obvious or clear solution. Um, it's not clear that uh, a, a nationwide lockdown was a good idea, uh, but, you know, you don't have counterfactual evidence. You may claim that it saved lives, but then we know that a lot of people lost lives because they lost livelihoods. Um, and could not get access to normal medical um, care uh, because of the lockdown. So these are all, I mean, it's a very, um, so for policymakers, um, it's, it, is, it is an enormous challenge. It's uh, um, how to deal with uncertainties, how to deal with what are known knowns, as Rumsfeld famously said, or the unknown unknowns. Um, those are real challenges for policymakers. But uh, I'm, uh, thank you for uh, bringing a focus onto policy making in addition to um, the legal regime and law. Um, so I now turn to Professor Chimney for his um, remarks, um, which we um, are keen to listen to. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Dean Sudarshan for giving me the floor. Uh, it's a, a, a real privilege to be part of this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, my own sort of thinking is that uh, uh, in order to address the uh, multi-pronged crisis uh, that uh, the world is faced with, uh, we first need to uh, identify the structural basis of that crisis. And in my view, the structural basis of the crisis is the global capitalist system, uh, at least in its neoliberal incarnation. Uh, and I think uh, it is the, uh, uh, the, the different sort of crisis that you mentioned. Uh, each of these can be traced back uh, to the workings or to the operation of neoliberal global capitalism. Uh, it's important to address that uh, uh, it is important to identify the beast because unless we do that, uh, we will not be able to, uh, uh, you know, find the necessary responses in order to address uh, the crisis uh, that we are confronted with and which is impacting as all of us agree on the most uh, subaltern sections uh, of the global population, the most marginalized and oppressed, uh, marginalized and oppressed sections. Let me just illustrate uh, uh, the, uh, the, the impact of neoliberal global capitalism on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the different crises. Uh, at first, the pandemic, of course, uh, now, I think uh, everybody, everyone has agreed that uh, the only way that we can overcome the uh, you know, pandemic is to ensure uh, that every individual in the world has access to, uh, access to vaccine. And, and, uh, yet, uh, the reality is uh, that in some continents, for example, in Africa, less than 10% of the population has, uh, has been vaccinated. But at the same time, while that is the reality uh, of what the WHO chief has called vaccine apartheid, uh, every effort by countries like uh, India and South Africa to secure a waiver uh, from the WTO TRIPS Council, and of course, from the WTO General Council, uh, for uh, a waiver on the application of the 
agreement on trade related intellectual property rights has been uh, stalled uh, has been stalled despite the initial support received even from the biden administration and the reality is that the interests of the big pharma uh, prevails over the interest of uh, 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 of the poor and uh, marginalized uh, uh, peoples uh, and groups in uh, and groups in the world uh, and the whole idea of stalling it is so that uh, uh, you know that reality overtakes us and we do not have uh, 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 and the need for waiver uh, itself goes away likewise uh, if you look at the climate crisis i think the very fact of naming uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, this phase in human history as the anthropocene itself is symbolic of the uh, of of the crisis and the hesitancy to call it uh, what the swedish economist mom calls capitalocene uh, uh, so and the, the the problem is not simply with naming the problem is that if the naming is not correct then the answers that you come up with which in this case is re relying even more on markets uh, not yield the necessary uh, outcomes the outcome is more likely going to be what has been called carbon colonialism uh, through carbon offsetting uh, and the refusal of course of the big uh, capital uh, to really do uh, take substantial steps uh, towards um, uh, 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 decarbon decarbonization likewise i can go on in, in the case uh, uh, as it was just mentioned in the case of the digital crisis uh, which emerges from the uh, coexistence of what has been called the surveillance uh, what has been called surveillance capitalism by professor jubov of harvard university uh, uh, and the surveillance state coming together uh, that crisis again cannot be addressed without global regulation and global regulation is being subverted uh, against the digital world by uh, the likes of Amazon, Google, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so whichever way you look, uh, th this is a crisis which is the outcome of uh, neoliberal global capitalism. So that recognition uh, rec can come back to a range of possible responses uh, that can be uh, put in place. Uh, you're right to suggest that there is a crisis of multilateralism. But I, I see this not as a crisis of one multilateralism, uh, a one-sided crisis, I would put it, of multilateralism. Uh, so multilateralism is not in crisis in the sense that the G20 are uh, complex. Uh, the crisis lies in the fact that the weakest, uh, uh, the, that the poor nations, the weak nations, and the weakest sections of their population are no longer heard. But that is the crisis of multilateralism. For the rest, multilateralism of the rich continues to function and function effectively. Uh, now, well, how do we address this? Again, we need to go back to, and I'll stop there. Uh, we need to go back to first principles. So the first principle is what is called now in political theory as the principle uh, of affected persons. That is those who are affected by global governance, global governance regimes, uh, as was mentioned by others, need to be heard. Uh, the democratic deficit that is present in the multilateral institution needs to be urgent because for the first time in the history of humankind, uh, is of the weak nations that are going to be affected. If we do not global warming, we are going to provide the there are, we know the rich are already planning to move to other. <laughs> they, they are already planning. They have invested sufficiently 
uh, to, 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 to uh, you know to, to leave for other spaces uh, but uh, we do not know if that would work out so we need to collectively uh, address our problems uh, and that can be done only if we uh, if we ensure the welfare of all the uh, the weak nations the poor and marg and the poor and marginalized peoples i'll stop there i'm sorry for going on for this long but this uh, uh, this is a troubling phase in our <laughs> yeah, uh, in thank you so, thank you very much professor uh, Jimmy. excuse me um, yeah you in the next round you may wish to um, switch off your video because your bandwidth is um, uh, weak. So we lost, um, you know, we, we got the drift of what you had to say, but we um, couldn't hear very clearly some of the words. They get elongated in some way um, when the bandwidth is poor. Um, so we, when we come back to the second round, we'll alert you if you um, can switch off your video and then speak. Um, we've had a very um, interesting a range of uh, comments and perspectives. One thing I picked up in this is that, you know, there's always been, um, uh, you know, as Professor Chimney pointed out, there's been a serious dissatisfaction with uh, what's uh, described as neoliberalism, the uh, international system um, and uh, capitalism uh, in its current avatar. And uh, there's been dissent. I mean, you know, we've had it in Seattle, we've, we, we saw it in Glasgow recently, um, and within countries, um, there have been many, many movements that um, uh, where ordinary people have got together um, to protest at um, the injustices um, that they see around the world. And, but on the other hand, we've got um, governments that um, are keen to, um, use all kinds of means, modern technology and so on to keep a watch on uh, not, not just those who come out and protest, but those whom they think are likely to foment uh, protest. And so a kind of preventive detention or preventive harassment um, of uh, people um, is already underway in, in many countries in various ways, including India. Um, so before we turn to some of the questions, you know, um, so be connecting, um, you know, uh, the nature of democracy, you know, uh, people have, you know, we, uh, Professor Reisberg started with uh, the lack of faith um, in institutions, in government, um, uh, among different population groups within people, uh, people who lived well and uh, um, had uh, harmonious uh, community life uh, now looking upon one another with suspicion if they belong to a different religion or a, a different income group, uh, a class, all of that. So there's that, there's, you know, evidence of dissent, evidence of suppression, uh, representative democracy seems to have run its course. People think that re elected representatives look to their own interests and don't serve the interests of people. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, John Keane famously called, uh, we are living in times of what he called monetary democracy, by which he meant that the internet and new forms of uh, asking questions and accountability are emerging, and maybe that's the direction in which democracy might go. So before we turn to um, questions um, that have come from the audience, um, I would like uh, some reactions to this, because this is a very immediate problem uh, of, of governments, not uh, policymakers, as Professor Sashikala Gurpur pointed out, not really being in touch with stakeholders of policy to make policy top down. Um, and then uh, if it is politically expedient to reverse the policy uh, in just the same way, top down, um, without debate and discussion. Um, we are witnessing these things all around. Um, and so, and, and then even within disciplines, and this is a question maybe you might wish to ask, there's a lot of churning going on, say, in a, in a discipline like economics, which informs a lot of public policy, in fact, uh, overly influences public policy relative to insights from other disciplines. 
uh, but economics itself is uh, grappling with what do you do in circumstances of uncertainty. There's no such thing as uh, uh, an equilibrium. There's no such thing as some price at which the market will clear. Um, then how do you revisit the foundations of that discipline? Um, so there must be that kind of uh, churning going on in other academic disciplines as well, because we've come face to face with growing uncertainty uh, about it. So the, the, you know, there's no confidence in the predictive power. Um, Evidence-based policymaking becomes a slogan. Uh, it's more like, uh, you know, uh, it's not evidence-based policymaking, but it's uh, policy-based evidence manufacturing that um, we witness um, in many places. So I'd like some quick reactions to this, this crisis. Of, this is about, about people, their institutions, uh, democracy, and, and of course, you know, some ways by which, you know, uh, these voices um, are heard and there's some reform um, in, the, in the capitalist um, um, framework uh, that all countries have now uh, bought into, um, you know, we uh, we thought that with that with free markets and so on, there'd be a corresponding opening up of the political space. But China is proving to us that that's not going to happen. In fact, the opposite will happen. Um, so these are concerns. So some quick reflections on these. I mean, you know, um, as to where do we see ourselves? Where do you see the world going? Um, so let me begin with you, Professor Chimney, and go in reverse order, um, since you put your finger on what you call the structural problem. Um, so uh, reactions to my comments, and then we'll take some questions. But you may wish to switch off your video. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dean Sudarshan. Uh, uh, my own uh, sort of view is that the structural crisis in uh, neoliberal global capitalism is also reflected uh, in the uh, in a global what I would call epistemic crisis. So there is a crisis in knowledge systems itself. Uh, let me take uh, uh, the example you gave economics. Uh, you would have probably seen uh, recent writings. Uh, uh, where, uh, which uh, point to the fact that even in the area of development economics, which is of crucial significance to global South nations, knowledge production, that is publications, are actually dominated by, uh, by scholars from the scholars from the uh, so scholars from the global north. And this is a very worrisome, this is a very worrisome tendency. And this uh, sort of uh, kind of crisis is reflected across disciplines in my own disciplines in international law. All the critical theories now have a much greater presence than they had two or three de decades ago. And by critical theory, I mean, uh, you know, feminist uh, international law theory, the third world approaches to international law, Marxist international legal theory, they do have a, a, some degree of presence, yet, uh, 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 the, the fact remains that mainstream international law scholarship continues to dominate the scene. Uh, even within mainstream scholarship, it is the most of the uh, uh, publications uh, uh, come from the come from the from from the global north. This is also true of critical of crit, uh, critical theory that much much of the publications emerge from the. Uh, uh, global north. So the point I want to make is twofold. One, that this uh, sort of uh, kind of skewed uh, 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 state of affairs, so far as knowledge production is concerned, needs to be addressed. Uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, needs to be addressed urgently. The second, of course, is uh, that uh, we need to ensure that the voices, as you said, from the ground, as others said, from the ground, need to um, uh, echo uh, within global policy making, global policy making, uh, uh, policy making uh, institutions. That is not sufficiently happening, despite the efforts of the global uh, efforts of 
uh, efforts of global uh, global civil society. So my sense is, and that uh, that the crisis in global capitalism uh, is integrally, internally, if I may put it that way, related to uh, the epistemic crisis, the crisis in uh, uh, in, uh, in knowledge production, especially the fact that uh, uh, much of uh, knowledge emerges from global north and its academic institutions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gurpur. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Professor Simi, for those uh, sharp insights. Um, I would uh, take it from where you left in terms of international law scholarship, um, in uh, terms of uh, uh, global north being the citadel of knowledge production whereas the global south uh, hasn't been forthcoming. The main thing is the richness of global south's culture and uh, the, uh, uh, the multifarious languages and expressions and the different stages of evolution of these academic institutions and scholarship who would have migrated, migrated like Rhodes Scholars and others, but they would come back and then uh, how far their opportunities and their inclinations are uh, going to be all inclusive is the question. So uh, there it would come to decolonization of the mind, decolonization of approaches and uh, multiple truths, uh, many ways of knowing, many truths to be um, um, unveiled, you know. Uh, see, uh, what, what I experienced was that complementarity of law and policy, complementarity of law and economics, as you rightly pointed out, Professor, and even Professor Sudarshan, and other disciplines would call for this commitment to truth. When we talk about commitment to truth, let's not forget. Uh, let's not forget power. Power in the, uh, in the main building uh, uh, forces of the state in the form of governmental power or in the form of uh, dominant voices or dominant groups. Um, so uh, the, the, that would mean that the power has to shift, it has to diffuse and the, that power and truth kind of conundrum which the uh, postmodernist world is, uh, world is talking about in terms of epistems need to be uncovered. So the claims, the truth claims to be validated. So what we see here is what Sir pointed out in terms of uh, I mean, chairman, sir, uh, producing evidences, you know, the, the idea of manufacturing consent, which uh, Noam Chomsky talked about, or Walter Lippmann's rationality belongs to the cool observer. Can we be the cool observers as scholars? No, we have to be passionate. Our emotions have to come into the center. So um, when we were working on uh, sex workers, I tell you what we learned from them. In Karnataka, we were asked to make the policy recommendation we thought that what they needed was a house to relax and uh, exercise their autonomy. But when we factored in their expressions and we statistically analyzed, of course, using all the modern technology, we came to the conclusion that what they wanted was dignity. So the paradigm of law and the reality and the truths of their lives in, as revealed in their descriptive case studies and uh, statistical surveys showed us that what we thought as truth was not the truth. They had their own worldview. They had their own experiences giving us the authentic truth. Therefore, today when the policy or the law in its democratic uh, support from the public opinion is being manipulated through online mechanisms, interest groups, uh, I think we are in a real uh, danger. So the time has come for us to look at this. For example, the correlation between trade and labor, uh, the whole geek economy, and uh, the, the collaboration between WTO and ILO, where is that collaboration? How strong is that collaboration? First, second, what do you call as innovation in terms of intellectual property rights protection? Um, third world uh, voices always spoke about traditional knowledge, the rich resource in biodiversity, but whether innovation has factored this in, if it has factored like we had the Jivani case in uh, India, whether there was uh, uh, equitable access and benefit sharing. The third is uh, the vulnerable people like um, compounded uh, realities of, let us say, those who are physically challenged or uh, mentally uh, unwell. Uh, these vulnerable sections, how have we factored in their realities? 
our legislations might have done it, but, the, but whether we have seen those laws and policies in action, um, look at the power of technology and usage of that power of technology to equitably distribute the capital, taxing the super rich, for example. Uh, now there is the whole uh, issue of uh, too much of concentration of wealth in two or three uh, companies or uh, CEOs and their rich lifestyles being uh, the occupants of the space of the whole media. Now, where is the legitimate question of their authority to own this wealth? Uh, the legitimacy of allowing, legitimacy of democracy of allowing such concentration of wealth? And what is what could be the role of our law and policy in equitable distribution and regulation of such uh, wealth accumulation? So I would say as one sentence, the search for global law and global justice and transdisciplinary epistem in this area would have to go in search of a common denominator while looking at commonalities and divergences in a transnational collaborative truth searching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that emphasis on truth in this era of post-truth. Um, uh, Professor Zahari, a, a, a minute or two. Thank you, Dean. Um, okay, to answer this question, I would agree with uh, Dr. Sh uh, Professor Shikala on the finding the tools and also um, the, the points made by uh, Prof. Jimmy on the crisis of knowledge and also the interdisciplinary, like on the economic aspects and whatnot. Um, the way I look at it, um, so we have the um, we have the problem that happened previously uh, where we look at things on the diagnostic approach. So we look at the what are the law uh, where we need to look at the background for each of the circumstances related to the issue at present. Um, so there's a need to look at the historical background and also the all the chronological events, uh, each of the case. And there is a, another approach to look at the what is the law or the policy at present. So we need to look at what are the problems um, what is happening now and how to solve it by having an idea policy as well as the policy in context. Um, but I think um, due to the late modernity, of course, um, we need to, um, to appreciate the interdisciplinary knowledge that I think is a bless as well because um, there's a, the, the, the knowledge, uh, be it a legal jurisprudence or public policy on positive law, they support each other. For example, early on, I talked about uh, the SDG 13 on uh, climate action. And also I talked about the SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy. So in order that uh, they are important to solve the present problems, and also the future issues for the next generation. However, uh, when it comes to the process of implementation, it must be appropriate. Okay, uh, as for example, like while uh, one is so eager with the education of knowledge, uh, sorry, with the education of the um, clean energy, for example, taking into position the SDG 7, they want to implement all the latest technology and also the infrastructures. However, um, as a researcher, we need to, as a policy maker, they need to look into, uh, they need to take into consideration whether it serves justice to all stakeholders. So in this regard, the, for example, the principle of um, energy justice come into picture. So the energy policy uh, that must track, uh, the energy policy that to be implemented must track the balance of the three triangulation uh, from the perspective of economics, that is where the economics come uh, is very, very important. The politics, especially when we deal with this uh, energy security, for example, and also the environment, when we talk about the climate change and mitigation. And these aspects um, of um, the aspect of energy must serve the core three tenets of energy justice. For example, there's a, a Adopting uh, distributional justice, okay, procedural justice, and recognition justice. So we need to consider the social welfare of the affected community, whether the energy policy, okay, that, uh, that will be introduced, uh, has been done with due process, and also there's a transparency where there's accountability and whatnot. So, so the regular jurisprudence and also the development of law 
and also policy supported by the intersectionality, I think is a bless and work in hand to solve the global society problem. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So over to you, Susan. Yeah, I know time is very uh, tight here, but I would like to, to just respond to Professor Chimney and a couple of the observations and think about another body of law we really haven't touched on today, yet it is, it, you know, I would beg to differ, is it being driven, driven by capitalism? That is the, the, you know, the field of human rights, um, grounded in philosophical principles about uh, individuals uh, reflected in constitutions, reflected in, in, in national laws, emphasizing the, the freedom of the individual. And um, if you, you know, think about how um, these rights have fundamentally transformed our engagement with um, our states, um, even with the uh, uh, non-state actors, and even at the international, even at the international level. And through this, I think we've seen, uh, thanks to technology, a fundamental trans transformation of the ability of the individual to be engaged at uh, the international level. We can access evidence through a click on the computer. We can gather it. Uh, we can become, uh, through uh, Instagram and other TikTok, uh, agents of, of change and, 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 and call out major actors and, 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 and the like. So with this ability to communicate, uh, it's no longer within the hands of the global elite. It's no longer in the hands of, 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 of the capitalists. It's no longer in the hands of government decision makers. It's in the hands of who are able to, getting back to the issue of, of gain respect, and uh, to be able to, you know, we would hope act in a, in, a, in a truthful manner. The concern is, is do we have an audience that is prepared to be as, as discerning? And it's on all sides. It could very well be uh, people in the United States who are angry at government, who embrace this medium and aren't prepared to question and, and, and believe in, in, in the, the half-truths or, or the misrepresentations, and then it takes on a life of, of, it, of, it, of its own. Um, I just think that, that in terms of, of international governance, we have a story on the human rights front that yeah. is a bit counter to what uh, Professor Chimney said, and it needs to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Reisberg, few minutes, uh, two minutes, maybe or three. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, gosh, you you're touching on a number of um, I would say interesting and and concerning issues. I will uh, focus on two points. The first one has to do with um, my co-panelist talked about the global north and the global south and the acts uh, intersection. Um, there's interesting discussions in the UK at the moment about the, the role of the UK in, in, you know, in addressing this rebalance. So, but there is an issue that very slowly governments and institutions and, and actually legal institutions and the, the Department of Development was, was discarded because of the crisis, because there's no money. So there is much more inward looking sort of thing in the UK on the one hand, Yet at the same time, you, the, the UK need to kind of, or, or claiming to take a bigger role. When politicians were asked about these questions um, and where there is any legal um, sort of enforcement mechanism, they basically only cite what I call saying, oh, but well, the UK is still the second or the third largest in terms of contribution. That's not good enough. It's not about that. It's about um, you know, raising your voice and, and, and taking this. Um, so the inward outward is a really interesting one. I think the pandemic has shifted that because there's so many, um, I would say, um, immediate concerns internally needs to be addressed. So many injustices within the society that have been, dis, um, I would think, exposed because of the pandemic. Um, that the governments um, are, are looking inwards with the time when they need to look outwards. The second point about technology, uh, which Susan just mentioned, I couldn't agree more. There's more and more voices. We have more and more tools to do that. Um, yet, um, even the tool that we are to using at the moment, Zoom, and think of this, there's too much power that, that is given to those companies to control certain things and action and directions. So to what extent, um, yes, we can use those tools, but without those tools, we will not be able to have, for example, you know, this discussion, this really fruitful discussion. But at the same time, does anyone of us know exactly where does the profit 
where does all the issues that Zoom is using, and I'm not, you know, you know, picking up on Zoom. It's just for the sake of the, the argument. Um, where is this going to? And are they actually listening to, you know, concerns in terms of employment? Are they actually, you know, protecting those who are working in the company? And um, most importantly, um, what is the long-term fact of this, uh, of, of, of concentrating power in those sort of small organizations, yet very powerful ones, that yeah. right, I would say, uh, governments in, in their power? But thank you. Thank you. I think we've come to the end. Um, when you remarked Zoom, I thought we must rephrase uh, Descartes. Uh, cogito ergo sum has now become cogito ergo zoom uh, for many of us. Um, yeah, so I, this has been a fascinating discussion. I won't attempt to, you know, sum it up. There's no time either. But I wanted, uh, I, when listening to um, uh, to all of you, and particularly Susan's um, focus on the legacy of um, human rights that uh, we've built up. Um, that um, animates uh, many constitutions and uh, many movements, civil society movements around the world. Um, I think that that gives us hope. Um, and so I, I, I recall a quote, I think it's from um, Martin Luther King, um, who said uh, that the morality cannot be legislated, but behavior can be regulated. Uh, public policy is all about changing behavior. And he said, judicial decrees may not change the heart, but they can restrain the heartless. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we, we have to conjoin, um, you know, the values and principles that underlie um, the entire legacy of international law and human rights and bring it to bear um, for policymakers, you know, to inform um, their uh, decision making as policymakers, uh, because um, the uh, uh, kind of an amoral uh, attitude towards policymaking um, is not going to help humanity any longer. So thank you all very much. This has been a wonderful discussion and I'm very, very honored and thankful to have been uh, a part of this uh, uh, conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.